So somebody has had the need to explain software to others. Have you ever done drawings on a whiteboard? Yeah. Have you ever run into a discussion where, what the, does that mean that you just drew up there? Yeah, that's what happens. So, and, and then another thing, and this is where, like Garrett talked about the urban community, about things that there are wonderful things hidden in existing urban solutions things, not just urban solutions to the company, but in urban solutions out there to problems, and it's not documented in a way except use the force, uh, source uh, and, and go and do that. It is not fun to try and understand a system by looking at the code. There are a few people in the world that have great ability in that and great fun. The rest of us, mere humans, we need something else. And this is where patterns and diagrams and things like that helps you. So what I'm going to do today is to go and do... I'm going against Garrett here. I'm going to sell, oversell your knowledge. I'm going to make it so that you run out of this auditorium. The first thing you do is to download it and get started doing it. Not just because it's going to be what you do for your business thing, because for the things it will do to your brain, your ability to think. That's important. And we just we've had all that introduction stuff. So, and then it's not just the patterns, it's also the idioms of Erlang. You said something a bit about it yesterday, and I'll keep pounding it in, hopefully until it sticks, uh, about what this is. Yeah. Then, my background, just how do I end up here talking in a functional programming conference? Well, you start out in the early 80s. Some of you were not born at that time. But some of us played around with basic and logo. Anybody tried logo? Yes, still, it's still alive, it's still kicking. I did it, I did it on an Apple IIe. And my basic was on a WIC 20. Anybody ever touched the WIC 20? The WIC 20, sorry. WIC 20. The WIC 20. Yeah. yeah. You did? Yeah. yeah awesome. It's a machine, it has 3,500 and something bytes of memory. It's an awesome machine. But anyway, you learn to program on that. It's got nothing to do with functional programming, but it's great fun. Then you step up, you get a PC, and you take up something called GW Basic. That's actually awesome. And then you get tired of Basic at some point because you say, there's more out there, and then you turn to Pascal. By the way, I did all of this on my own. I just randomly shuffled around. There was no internet back then. So this was all based on whatever magazine you could find. Yeah, paper thing, you know, like few pages. And, yeah. So and then, then I graduated from high school and went to university, and then we started on something weird. Standard ML. The first language ever exposed to me by somebody teaching it to me. This was the biggest eye opener ever, because while I was getting ready to university, I was taking a year off, and I said, okay, I know I'm going to need C programming. So I got the Koenig and Ritchie book. And I read 20 pages, and I started crying. Because <laughs> <laughs> C, that was not for my brain. Not at that point. But Stephen well, worked, and it made me think about how to program. And we also did something with MATLAB. And then, I happened to be in what you call the Renaissance of university education. Back then, when they taught you enough stuff to make you able to think, so I actually was exposed to assembly as well. That's just one thing. I actually burned some components and had paint all over the floor and the lab, but that's another thing. Then we had APL2. Anybody tried that? No. This is awesome. You write with Greek letters only. <laughs> you write five of them, and it does 20 pages worth of things. The problem with this. If you don't document it with like two pages, five minutes later you don't know what you do. <laughs> but it changes your head slightly. So then we had Mathematica, we actually did a fear improver for uh, geometry in that, just to make fun. Uh, there. Then we had concurrent Pascal, C++, uh, there. Um, I, actually, I actually volunteered to do an extra presentation on diamond shaped inheritance in C++. I never use C++ again. <laughs> Then we were subjected to Prolog, which is awesome. It makes you think in a totally different way. Then, 
I had an idea that I needed to know something about hardware. So I did some VHL and actually also some microcode. Microcode is insane. This is how you build your own assembly commands. It's how, almost as low as you can go. And I never looked back again. Then I also played with concurrent ML and Gopher, which is a variant of Haskell. Yeah. And the point here being, I've been subjected to a number of different ways of programming. It's made my brain the way it is today, at least when it comes to programming. And that's actually important. You need to subject yourself to different things. One of them is functional programming, and one of them definitely is Erna. But we'll get into that. Then there are actually also programs with ATEC. If you can program with that, I've actually made a chess engine in tech. So you can write in the, the moves of a chess game, and whenever you feel like it, you can show the board. And it has an internal board representation, and it bounces if you put in the wrong move. Yeah, go check it out. People say that due to that code, I can claim that I can code Lisp because there are so many parentheses in it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, and then we have the start of my, my dark years. So I, I started teaching Java. Um, well, to my excuse, I also taught the people how to do recursion in Java. So I'm uh, <laughs> just trying to say And then I went on and I got a job with Motorola. And they, I don't know if they sensed that I couldn't code at that point. So they made me a people manager and process improvement guy, and that means what you're programming in there is predominantly Excel. Then you need to do some shell scripting, and I actually took on to do some Perl to solve a particular problem to sort out some things. And then I learned the thing that we always teach children in Denmark. If you have a rocket, you put fire on it, and it doesn't go off. Don't go back to it. I've never gone back to Perl. <laughs> yeah. So, anyway, so to a certain extent, then you're doing all these things and you're doing people management, process improvement. At some point, you go, ah, well, I did. So, you have to do something else, and then Erlang comes along. Somebody had started, that was me, a PhD project with a guy called Jan Henry Newstrom. Look up everything he's written, it's awesome. And he came back and presented the results he's been doing together with Motorola. And I said, wait a minute. This is the answer to all my prayers. This is how I can get out of management and do something that's fun again. And this, this is actually important here. You get to this point in your career, you need to feel where your heart is. If your heart is not in what you do, you need to change, otherwise you die. And the second time you die, well, the first, second time is just a formality. The first time you die is important. Avoid that. No, so um, I went on and uh, I convinced Motorola management to do a project using Erlang. And if you look at it, Motorola, Ericsson, Arch Enemies, let's take the Arch Enemies language and make it into something we use for product. It's stupid. But it worked. And uh, it, it, it gave me some scars on my soul and uh, everything. But I learned so much. And I've never been happier. Even if I had to do something in C. And what we did here, uh, okay, slight question here. Has any of you been in contact with the police recently? <laughs> yeah. Did you notice their nice radios? <laughs> yeah, so they have these Tetra radios. And that's what we did at Motorola. We did Tetra radios. <laughs> and, uh, well, of course, we didn't put Erlang on the, diff the mobile or the radio, as it's called. You're not allowed to call it a phone. Because then you, the old guys will look at you and your career advancement opportunities for the next three years are like gone. <laughs> anyway, but some customers had the audacity not to buy a Motorola system. It's like, why, why fight it? Just buy the best product in the world. Well, there are other things to that. But anyway, but then when you have two countries that are bought from different vendors, you need to connect the two. And that's what we did with our earning system. We wrote an inter-system, inter, uh, interface gateway thing that could bridge between two systems running Tetra, meaning that a police officer that came to the border and he's like, wait a minute, my radio won't work over here. I can't chase the criminal. No, now he can chase him again. Radio still works, which <laughs> for police officers kind of like. So, so that's what, and we did that from scratch. I had no, not a single line of code. We wrote it all in Erlang and C, mostly Erlang because C, yeah, well, that's C. And then, uh, <laughs> later on, 
I'm <coughs> dabbling a little bit with the legs here because it's kind of nice. And uh, again, trying to keep open because you can see my progression of keep being open has, has slowed down over the years. So well, that's the sort of thing. If you can't get all this in university, go search for it yourself. It's very, very important for you uh, in the long run. Good. Now, why am I giving, why I'm giving this talk? First of all, I want to show the business value of Erlang. Because if it has technical merit, it's got nothing to do with it. If it's not going to make somebody money, you're not going to do it, except in the university on your spare time. So that's important. That's also why we got to do it at Motorola. We showed business value. Then I want to introduce some Erlang patterns. There's some few of them to show the idea that we're now doing something in the Erlang community to document how to do certain Erlang things and help you uh, get up and running uh, faster. And then, my nickname is the Erlang Priest, so uh, I'll spread the Erlang love. <laughs> the, the love and the gospel of the one true church of programming. So, we'll go on with that. So, Erlang Solutions, we have a number of customers, and actually here, here's a number of reasons why you should do Erlang with all these great companies. But if you take WhatsApp there in the middle, there are 19 billion good reasons why you should use Erlang. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then we also have a lot of university relations, uh, which means that we actually are quite active in working together with research to do things, and also to take in students and do thesis projects and fun stuff like that. Um, yeah, so now. I want to put a bit of history or context into how uh, these things come about and how we end up with something that has business value to programming language. So, and before we do that, this is something, the thinking here, I'm going to present now, is what also has influenced greatly how Erlang is designed. So that basically, there are two ways of conducting a software design. design. You can make it so that they're simple that there are obviously no deficiencies. Garrett can vouch for that. Or you make it so complicated that there are no obvious deficiencies. Does anybody know who said this? Or, yeah. And do you know when he said it? No. 50 years ago or something. In 81, when he accepted the, the Turing Award. 81. This is still true. But this is also some of the thinking of that went into designing Erlang. So if you do Erlang right, it will be easy to reason about it. It will be easy to see if there are deficiencies in it. And if you can see that there are no deficiencies, why the hell would you buy tons of testing on it? No, you f put that up to a side and you test the, the things you can't reason about after all. So, and Ericsson, back then, they're a commercial entity. They know how to make money. So what they wanted, they wanted short time to market. When they started embarking on, on saying we want something better, it took them like three years from when they had an idea until they ship the product with that idea. That's a long time. And uh, then they wanted to do on-the-fly uh, upgrades. And one of the reasons for that was that every time one of their systems was down, they were not making money. So they had to do something to keep the system running all the time. And they also wanted quality and reliability because basically phone calls is like the most important thing in the world. If that's not working, we're going to go mental. So, yeah. And they also have more uh, in this. And if you want to see the details of this, you go and look out uh, uh, Bjarne Decker's uh, thesis, uh, he listened to his thesis, uh, which explained the whole history, technology management wise, of how Erlang came about. It's a brilliant read. Even if it has all that fancy title stuff on it, it's a brilliant read. Uh, you must go and read it, even if you don't want to use Erlang. Yeah. But actually, what they wanted was they wanted productivity. They wanted no downtime, because that's on the, on the uh, upgrades there. And they wanted something that always works. Unfortunately, or not unfortunately, but these Ericsson managers, this was back in the mid-80s they started this initiative. So through their younger days, they've been listening to a lot of ABBA music. And what they really, really wanted, and it's way easier to say when you talk to business people, what they wanted was money, money, money. <laughs> it's a rich man's world. So there you go. <coughs> this is something you have to keep in mind. Whatever you come up with, be it Erlang, be it Haskell, be it Clojure, be it Scala, if it doesn't show money, it's going to be a tough sale. Um, there. 
I learned that the hard way. So, <coughs> so and then another thing here about Erwin is that it's actually made for telecom. So you have a domain and you need to, 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 to need, uh, serve the needs of that domain. Then you can take something like C++ or Java. I could also draw C, but then the, the, the spot would be very small in the middle. Uh, there. So you, that comes a bit of the requirements for that domain, meaning that the entire thing there, the gap there, this is what you need to write before you fill out the requirements of that domain. So that's a lot of work. Oh, this, this drawing is simplified so managers can understand it. <laughs> then you have Erlang. It's bigger than C++ and Java in all regards. Meaning that the gap here is a lot smaller. So the amount of code you need to write. And also the semantic mismatch between what Erlang provides and what you need to do in the telecom domain, domain is a lot smaller. And that smaller gap equals money. I'm sorry to keep saying money, but uh, that's what it's all about. That's a big benefit of running here. And the sweet spot, and this is also where the ingeniousness of uh, Ericsson and the computer science lab over there was, they didn't design Erlang to cover everything on the globe. No. Coordination, control, middleware, this is where Erlang shines. Graphical user interfaces, pfft, forget about that. Drivers, ah, scary stuff. We have to see for that. And it works. So you can interface with these things. Meaning you can cover all the needs in your system by combining the right set of technologies. And this is also where the next one goes, just to try this to explain this in a different way. And also because I've had management classes, so if I don't show a two-dimensional graph, I'm not doing a presentation. So I have to run this through you. So you have the driver's coordination in the graphical user interface. So you have a need of telecom. You need a lot of drivers. You're doing very exotic hardware, so you need to interface with that. And you have a lot of coordination because these Telephone centrals, they have hundreds of thousands of ongoing phone calls at the same time. So you need to coordinate all of that. If you take C, C is awesome for drivers. If anybody says they want to write a drive in something that is not C, you have, have to take them aside and, and try to help them or, or just put them to, to sleep because it's, it's going to be too much pain for them. So there, and then you have the coordination. C is not good for coordination. It's a language made for operating systems and drivers. So, yeah. And due to the number of libraries there, it can actually do a bit of the graphical user interface. So then you design Erlang. You make sure it sucks in doing drivers. Because you want people to use C to do the drivers. So make sure you suck at doing drivers. Excellent design choice. Then you make sure the coordination is something you just rock at. Because then nobody's going to use C for it. That chance, but anyway, and then you also make sure that you suck at doing graphical user interfaces. You focus on what you're supposed to be good at, and then you say, Okay, wait a minute, I need to address my telecom needs, so I just combine C and Erlang, and everybody's happy. And that's what Ericsson is doing this day. They are combining C and Erlang to make rock products that make a lot of money. They make so much money that a million kroner or 100,000 pounds is not something they can take into their books. So, yeah, that's the amount of money they make. So, and then, another thing, let's use the core again. If the tool we are using to build something is so complicated that it becomes part of the, well, problem, something is wrong. And it is. Sorry to bring that up again, but C++, if you go and look around, job ads with people needing C++, it's more about mastering C++ that being able to use it for something sensible, the domain knowledge means nothing. The language should never be a part of the equation in how you solve a problem. Of course, it is, uh, the language is there, but it shouldn't be part of what makes it complicated. The language should make things easy. And again, it's Hall who said this, and uh, he is a pretty smart guy. Uh, yeah. No, no, <coughs> it's designed for telecom. And if it was only for telecom, this talk would have been over a long time ago. But the thing is, the requirements Erlang addresses actually means that it's good for messaging. XMPP, we have EJWD, we have Mongo, so in from Erlang Solutions. Web servers have done it. It's yours, Chicago Post, Cowboy. Super, Erlang is super for this. If you want to do a payment switch or soft switch, yes, Vocalink, we're working with them. OpenFlow Link is a switch we've done. A link is a switch for OpenFlow we've done together with the American company. You have distributed databases, you have React, CouchDB, Scalaris. And here we actually have 400 million reasons why you should use Erlang. CouchDB was something that the, the guys behind, um, what's that drawing, draw something. 
they were having scaling issues. Then they switched to CouchDB, which is written in Erlang, and then they scaled out like crazy, and they were bought up for $400 million. Okay, I can live with $400 million. It does happen to be the 19 billion uh, there. So that, again, Erlang to the rescue. And then it's also used for queuing system, RabbitMQ uh, with the AMQP uh, protocol. It's also been done uh, using Erlang. So, and what's the overall theme for what's a good Erlang domain is that you put low latency over throughput. So if you want to do serious hardcore number crunching, don't use Erlang. Use something else uh, there. If you have something where the interactions are stateful, then Erlang is a good match. If you just have something that's stateless, so you take a request and you do something, you send a reply and you're done, use Python or something. Don't, don't, <coughs> don't hurt yourself uh, there. If you have something that's massively concurrent, then Erlang is also your friend. And, okay, control, control, no, no control. Uh, no guess, can't do this. So, yeah. And then if you need something that's distributed, the minute you start talking about having something that is on more than one computer, I triple dare you to find some language that's better suited for this than Erlang. Period. Period, period, period. Yeah. Then there's also fault tolerance, which is, uh, if you need uh, fault tolerance, Erlang is also good. And if you need to use OTP, if you just need to use basic Erlang, maybe you need to use some other language. But if you have something where you really need OTP, then it's a good thing. And if you need non-stop operation, Erlang is also your friend. I don't know of many other languages where you can do on-the-fly upgrades of your code. So, there you go. Anyway, and then we have one more consultants, and this is where people do their performance benchmarks on pesky little lows. When you have real load, Erlang performs as well or better than everybody else. And that's actually what's important. Because your manager doesn't care when you're at 10% load. He cares when you're at 150% load what, what goes on in your system. This is where Erlang shines. Good. And now I'm going to show you this one. This is, by the way, one of the... This is world first, this one, and there'll be other world first here. Kid you not, some of this has not been shown to other people uh, before. The golden trinity of Erlang. If you understand this, and if you understand how these things fit into one another, you would know how to use Erlang. So it's not that complicated. So, Erlang has three tenants that really makes it Erlang. It's share nothing, so you don't share memory. You have processes, it has their own memory space, they don't share that with anybody else. And then they communicate by message passing. Then you have fail fast. So I don't know who came up with this, but somebody from the Ericsson team back then must have been to Japan. Because processes, they take on a very honorable stance. If they don't know how to do something, they've dishonored themselves and they will just go, oh, oh, gone. Fail fast. It's actually important in order to do a system that works. But in order to live with that, and you have all your minions running around killing themselves, <laughs> you need to have failure handling. This is the golden trinity of Erlang. This is what makes Erlang shine. And if you take away the failure handling, I'm not coding Erlang anymore. So, that was not a promise, that was a warning. <laughs> yeah. anyway. So, good. So to share or not to share, how this works is, if you have, and this is how you traditionally do things in C and other things, you have shared memory, you have two processes, one of them does some dishonorable thing and crashes, <coughs> And that corrupts the memory. Duh! Not so fun. That, and that actually happened uh, at Motorola, that the big pile of shared memory in their C programs, it got corrupted. The only sane thing to do is to take down the entire machine. The problem is, when you take down the entire machine that's running all the policemen's calls, you need to do a failover to another zone controller, that's what those were called, that needs to be brought up and everything and then it can run. That triggers a ton of alarms in the alarming systems. And these are not just little yellow alarms in the corner. They are big full screen alerts. Boom, boom, some controller down, down. And you just go, whoa. That means somebody's calling somebody inside Motorola saying, our system doesn't work. That means that that's somebody calls some high ranking manager that ends up calling the boss in Denmark where we were sitting. And that means that that manager gets pissed because he's been called 2 a.m. in the morning. So he calls some engineer. You don't want that. You don't want the vice president calling you at 2 a.m. in the morning for a number of good reasons. 
This is what happens with this uh, setup. So in Erlang, you do it differently. Yeah, I have to kill that one. In Erlang, you have memory for each process. That means when the first poor guy dies, it corrupts its memory. Process two. C'est la vie. <laughs> I don't care. It's the other guy died. And that memory is corrupt. And then you say, oh, wait a minute, corrupt memory. Yeah, yeah, but we have a garbage collector. Gone. Beautiful. This is what is good to have in order to, to isolate errors. Now, then again, failures. Murphy, we all know Murphy. So anything that can go wrong will go wrong. Basically, you just add to that anything that shouldn't go wrong will go wrong and then just multiply that by 100. So we have programming errors. Yeah, hard to believe that intelligent people like us would do a programming error. But I'll tell you one thing. If you want to avoid making errors, the only sane way or safe way is to do nothing. If you want to do that for a living, you need to be inside a really, really big organization. <laughs> <laughs> or you need to be on management. But I have seen, I have seen developers who have mastered this art of doing nothing and still surviving. So anyway, but we don't want that. We want to change the world. It's good. So we accept we do errors. Then the disk will fail on you. Forget about buying the top-notch everything. It will fail. And it will fail at 2 a.m. in the morning. And then the network will fail. That will happen even more often. So you need to be able to deal with that. So these create failures. So Erlang, or other languages, and we take all the other languages, they're fault intolerant. They don't know about faults. Basically, they're being like middle managers. If you're reporting to a guy, to a medical manager, he has to be a middle manager. If it's top boss, it doesn't help. He has to have a middle manager. He squeezes in between you and some upper management. That's the best situation. So this is like programming paradigms. They're fault intolerant. They cannot tolerate errors. And that means you deal with all the errors, or you die. <laughs> this is how these programming languages work. And middle managers as well. So, anyway. So, Erlang uh, is fault tolerant by design. Which means that we embrace errors. And we manage them. And this comes back to what you said yesterday about having a language for something. If you don't have a language for something, you can't really talk about it. It's the same thing if you have a psychological issue. You don't normally have an issue, for, uh, a language for that, so you go to a shrink. And he gives you the, or she, gives you the tools to deal with that. It's the same thing here in Erlang. You can manage and you can talk about errors. And that's a very important in order to do something that works. And you can ping me later uh, regarding some articles on this, uh, where you can see that thinking. So it's just not me ranting here. Then. And now, in Erlang, let it fail. This is very important. So here's a conversion function. That's not the nicest version of that, but anyway. So here you're converting the day into a number of the uh, week. And here you're adding, maybe somebody will not send me a weekday. So I need to handle that case. No, 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 no. Don't do that. Simply, that code is not worthy of living. You fail fast. Don't worry about anything else. Just fail fast. And that means that in Erlang, you can, Erlang encourages being aggressive or offensive in your programming as opposed to being defensive. And here, here's uh, the outcome of uh, the study that was done with Motorola by Jan Henry. So you have this uh, code that actually solves the problem of the customer. This is what makes money at the end of the day. The code that solves the problem of the customer. And here you have the C++ version uh, of a, a component, you had a magnificent 19% of the code dedicated to solving the problem of the customer, and 81% of the code doing God knows what. Defensive programming, type declarations, communication, memory management. Ah. Yeah. And then you go on and you have other versions of where it does even less. And then the Erlang version, two versions that were done, over 60% of the code was actually focused on solving the problem. This is about being a good fit for the domain. And this is actually important, because uh, when you have 3x, your productivity also raises. And another thing is, you end up being happy, because you're focusing on solving problems, and not dealing with memory, type decorations, and all that other fun stuff. You're doing something like that, that's uh, extremely important. So, and then, it's also about well, how efficient is it? Because I, I was being uh, made fun of at Motorola because, yeah, it's just your little team that does Erlang, it's fine. 
Then I did a function point analysis to show that Erlang is three to four times as effective as using C++ and Java. People stopped talking to me after that. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's better than being made fun of. Until one day, my boss, that has been one the one picking on me all the time, uh, he said, I have a problem. Do you think Erlang can solve it? And I said, hello, can you repeat that one? <laughs> but that's indirect praise, so you have to, to suck that up. That's another thing here, career advice. This let it crash thing, don't run around the hall saying that in a company that's pretty anal about keeping system up. You have to say something else. You need to say you're doing graceful uh, error recovery or something like that. Don't say let it crash. People will think you're insane. Uh, yeah, and maybe I am. So anyway, now I'm going to do something. This is going to be very controversial. This is the world first. Uh, and this is to, to, to explain the system. I've devised something called Visual Erlang by stealing from other notations. And the idea here is, I want something that's detailed enough to cover important aspects. All the things I've been talking about while Erlang is great, I want to cover those aspects in a visual notation. And I don't want to be able to explain every bloody little detail of Erlang. That's not the level I'm at. So I'll take criticism for that, but I'll just point to this point and say, this is not what I'm doing. And then I want to see if we can standardize on how we show Erlang architecture uh, there. And here, as you can see, this is <coughs> fresh on my hand. I haven't even had time to put it into some nice drawings, so just handwriting. So we have a process, that's just an ellipsis. If you have a process that monitors another one, it has two uh, uh, lines to it, and then a round circle. And then you have, so you have two round circles at each end of these things. The, these two processes are linked. And being linked in Erlang, this is part of the failure uh, mechanism. If one of these two processes dies, and they're, they're linked to one another, the other one will die as well. It's a very social environment, Erlang. You die together. <laughs> yeah. And then you also have a way to spawn processes, so that's by adding an error to it. And then you can trap exits, so if you link to another one and you say, I don't really want to, to die when he dies, you can trap exits, and then you put two uh, ellipses around the, the process name. So, and then you can send messages, because that's important, and then you use message passing, and uh, you write a wavy error, and then you send a message. And then you have this thing to have some abstract functionality here. So handle down is something where you're handling down messages for somebody you are... Uh, monitoring or the link to. In this case, P1 will be trapping the exit from P2 and then do something about that other process dying. And this is an important aspect of understanding how a learning system works, so you need to have some notation for, for dealing with that particular case. And then you also need to have functions and state data. Erlang, Erlang has this thing that it's sort of functional programming language, but the main point is concurrency. And these processes, they carry around state. That's why you need something to be able to have that. And then here I have a notation here to show that I have a process, it has some state data, and it has some public API. And that's the important part here. You need to explain to others how they can interact with you. So, good, I have five minutes. Then that means we'll be running for this file. So here's one of the uh, things, and these things, because we have to go through them very fast, these will come out like the gang of four books for uh, object-oriented programming we will be publicizing small little two to three, four pages of explanation of what is this uh, pattern good for, how does it work, and it will be only about learning things. I'm not going to sit down and translate every stupid object-oriented pattern into Erlang. I'm going to do Erlang patterns that matters. And in this case here, we have something where we have a process that protects an edge table on, on the, on the right-hand uh, side, and then it allows everybody to read from it without going through the process. So what I'm really doing here, I'm only serializing the writes to this X table. And this is explained in two pages in one of these patterns. Right there. So we'll just scoot very fast. Here's an explanation of how, how a supervisor in Erlang works. And that actually works by, it has a start link function. You have that up there. there. And then it has some start functionality here that actually spawns off all the children of this supervisor. And that means whenever one of those, you see here, it's monitoring it, it's actually linked to it uh, there, and it's trapping exit. So whenever there's an exit signal, there's some supervising thing that will take a decision, should I restart this child or should I terminate 
because supervisors they're also social animals. So if they see a child that is dying too too often, they will kill themselves. So yeah, this is also one of the things why it's complicated to learn learn an OTP because these things are not bloody obvious when you look at them the first time. And that's why we're going to even if a supervisor is a standard thing, and I'm going to put that in as a as a pattern. And the reason I'm doing that is because I want to be able to talk to people that are not Erlangers, for instance, Java programmers in big companies, and explain to them what it is they need to do and how they need to twist their mind to start uh, into Erlang. And then there's a simple manager work, we'll skip that. So the business benefits of supervisors is only one process dies, that's the isolation thing here. And supervisors or patterns, it's the same thing here. So this isolation gives you continuous service. It will only be a part of your system that goes down if something goes wrong. Everything is locked when you do it right, no. like OTP, meaning you know what is wrong. So that means when you've been called at some weird time of the night, you get a, an hour lock and you can actually figure out what's going on. We use that when we're doing this uh, gateway at Motorola, up against IOP testing with our competitors. It took us 20 minutes from the minute we had an hour until we had a new fixed version deployed on our system. Five minutes later, they have an error. Oh, no, 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 no. 24 hours later, they have a fix. Can't compete for that. So, and that another thing here with this supervision thing is, given that you can see what's going on, you keep your system alive with these supervisors, and you can respawn things there, it means if you have a corner case that only happens ever so rarely, you can fix it when it has business value to do it. Not because you have to do it because every time it happens, your entire system goes down and you have that chain of phone calls and in the middle of the night. So that's sort of there. And that means whoever owns this product is in charge. He decides when to take in a bug fix. Because when it makes business sense, he can do it. If it's something he can fix manually and it's cheaper than fixing it, he can postpone it. This is extremely important. This is also, it's not the software that's in charge. That means you have a software architecture that supports iterative development. And not only iterative development, it supports evolutionary development. When you're starting adding features you didn't think of in the beginning, you have your supervisor trees here helping you make code that runs safely. Extremely important. You can't do that in other languages. There. So we should have a blah, 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 blah. Have a language for it. Okay. So then the managers will go, when do I get my money back? Well, <laughs> if you have some cool technology, you'll be able to get up and running and do some prototyping really fast. Then in development, yeah, you're doing fine, and then ah, you start to slow down. You put the thing into something where you ship it, and then the, your development speed just goes down and down and down. Uh, there, there. But in Erlang, it's a little more difficult to get started. We need to think about all this structure, supervision trees and everything, which means that if you're doing prototyping, it's, it's going to take you a while. We can take that out for us, Gary. <laughs> so, but if you do this to be there, you will be at a higher speed at some point during the prototyping. In development, you will stay above the others in development speed. And when you go into maintenance, which is where 80% of every software aspect will live its life, you will stay at a very high, much higher speed. So that's how you get your return on investment. A key building blocks, yes, share knowledge process, message passing, fail fast approach, link monitor concept. And you deal with failures in sensible manager because you have a language for them. Remember that. Here, failures is not something we hide away under the table. We deal with it. That's the mature adult way of doing things. And then you have Elixir, a few words on that. As I said most of it yesterday. The important point here is you still need to understand how the Erlang programming model works in order to use Elixir effectively uh, if you're doing something this you will concur. I think I can have that. So cruising with Erlang, keep the trinity in mind by understanding the failure model, embrace failure, use pattern to de deliver business value. Don't just invent your own stuff uh, there. You stay in charge. Don't ever let the software be the guiding thing on uh, whatever you're doing. Use the patterns, stay in charge. And that's it. Thank you. So.
something. The most read thing is Bjarne Decker's uh, Dissentate uh, thesis. Uh, there, it's available on Erlang.org, and you can see that it's a, it's a story about technology management, and it's really important to understand how technology actually gets accepted, approved, and shaped. Masterpiece, and it's readable. It's not made for some old doctors to read. It's actually yeah. readable. Yeah. It's hard to know how Bjorn, Bjorn Dexter is written if you're not getting the pages in. Yeah, no, but it's written in uh, English. No, no, the, the name. Yeah, uh, oh, Dekka. Oh. I'm working on it. Yeah, uh, within a month, I will have it cleaned up. And if you want to be a review of some of these things, send me a mail, and uh, then you get to uh, influence it. Uh, at least give me an idea about that. You told me you're smoking the wrong stuff here. You need to do something else. So, yeah. So that's work in progress, and you get it. I'll try to do it iteratively. Get one pattern out, and then another one, and do that. But right now, the main focus is, is getting the notation a little more streamlined. Because if you don't have a notation you agree on, then it's going to be difficult to have discussions. So.